My name is Helen Nguyen. I am the chef and owner of um, Saigon Social, a Vietnamese restaurant in the Lower East Side here in New York. Welcome to The Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all over. Thank you for coming on, Helen. I know you're really busy. What does it mean to be Vietnamese to you nowadays? What does it mean to be Vietnamese to me? Huh. You know, I think it's really important to that we that we retain and retain and share our culture and our history. I, and I, when I say that, I know that you know everyone's journey is very different from from one another. But you know, just understanding where your family comes from, understanding the history, understanding, you know, just the essence and the foundation of who you are as a person, I think is, you know, is, is very important. Um, so for me, it's just, you know, I think it's, it's not just, you know, a, a phase, it's, it's like an ongoing journey, a lifelong journey of just really understanding, you know, uh, you know, um, your roots. You're, um, you were, were you born here in the U.S.? I was. I was born in Concord, California. <laughs> you're, you're Vietnamese. I mean, we spoke Vietnamese several times, and it's really on point, and you listen to a lot of Vietnamese. What, where do you think all of that developed from? Um, you know, growing up in the 80s in California, I remember that it was probably the beginning. I, I just remember growing up listening to a lot of music. Um, and with my, my parents listened to a lot of new wave. I remember it was kind of the beginning of Vietnamese concerts in, in, in the States. Um, I remember attending Lina Jang Dai concerts when I was maybe like three or four years old. Wow. Um, so though I didn't quite understand, you know, the language at that time, the sounds and the music and, you know, the melody really resonated. Right. So I think to me that was kind of like the the, the very first exposure and, and introduc int introductory phase. Um, though I didn't truly learn how to speak Vietnamese and 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 I have a you know a bearing of the language until I was probably 11, 12. It's amazing. It's I amazing. learned how to speak Spanish before I learned how to speak Vietnamese. <laughs> so so your Spanish is pretty good. It's 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 possible. <laughs> yeah. I've heard you speak both. Mm. And, you know, your Vietnamese is, is very impressive. And, you know, I wonder this connection to our, our language, you know, for me too, I, I just love the language so much. But, you know, perhaps somehow in the journey of learning our language and getting proficient at it, we've somehow managed to, to grow into these personalities that love Vietnam so much because it's evident when we go to your restaurant Saigon Social that it shows up in every aspect obviously the food the music the decor um, and it's almost impossible if you kind of don't have that link to the language right I think it's a beautiful language I mean I think I was very I was very enamored when I first um Start, start, first started understanding just very basic vocabulary. And I think that when you really submerge yourself, um, you know, in a song and listen to the lyrics, which I, which, you know, is what I did and, and kind of like my very first teacher um, in the language, it was just very beautiful, but also very intriguing because the way that lyrics are written and the way that the language is spoken in music is very far off from you know just like the yeah. the, the the regular day to day tongue because nobody speaks to each other that way you know what I mean, um, so I thought it was very beautiful you know and and it always you know I always wondered you know what like why it was that way because when you're younger you don't really have that that foresight or that depth of understanding as to you know like okay this is like the literature form and this is the layman's term right. Um, but then as my vocabulary expanded, I was like, wow, these, these songs are beautiful. There's just so much depth and passion and, and, you know, the culture kind of lies in that in itself. Yeah. And so many of us, uh, you know, growing up without that sort of that link to the language, we, we, 
yeah, I mean, there, there was a time where I would listen to music, Vietnamese music, and it was just kind of repelling almost. It was kind of cringy because, you know, it was just to me at the time growing up, not understanding fully what the, the, the words meant. And especially when you're listening to Kai Lung. Yeah. Yeah. It's just really difficult to, to process, right? The sounds. Right. Especially right. Kailun, yeah. Mm -hmm. But as as you get older, there's there's so much beauty in in all of it. Yeah, I mean, my mom in the '80s had a very strong accent, which was really hard to mm -hmm. understand for others. I mean, she's my my mom is from Guiyang and my dad is from Nyajang. so Nyajang has you know a a mild central accent. But Guinyang is very close to like, you know, Guangyai and Danang and they like the tonality is very, um, it almost sounds very harsh because the pitch is very high. The tones can also be very deep and um, there's different uses in, in like certain like verbs and conjugation, if you will. Um, so... I, it was very confusing because when you're, when you're a kid, you didn't realize that there was so many different dialects yeah. um, and so many different ways to, to express and, and, and to just to really speak. Yeah. Quang Ai is very difficult to understand if you're not familiar with the words and the way it's being spoken. Right. Yeah. You know, before we get into all of this uh, food business, um, I want to ask you, What's the deal with Fernet and your love for Fernet? And why is it <laughs> everywhere? You know, um, it feels like it just, it permeates in your, your mind space when, when we're there and, you know, we're offered it, you're, you're offering it and it's just everywhere. So um, I want to say, was it 2000, 2007, 2008? I was, you know, at that time I was still living in Seattle I had a lot of stomach issues um, and I always thought it was because my tolerance for very spicy and very hot foods was very high and I thought it was just indigestion, but I was having constant stomach, you know, stomach problems. And I remember there was a few different restaurants um, that my friends own that were essentially within walking distance with each other. And um, it's where I used to host a lot of my real estate clients and happy hour was almost a, a daily thing. And I got to know the, you know, the, the team and the staff very well and became friends with the bartender. And he was like, you need to try this. You know, it, I, I promise you it's going to make your stomach feel better. And so then my very first introduction, um, I thought it was the most disgusting thing ever. It tasted like kubak. <laughs> it's very herbally. It's very minty. It's very, very strong and pungent and was not very enjoyable at all. But then within a couple of minutes, it started to alleviate my stomach pains. And I was like, wow, this actually does work. What's in it, you know? And so then from that moment on, whenever I felt like, you know, I needed, um, you know, uh, just like a remedy for for indigestion that was kind of like my go-to because you know it's a digestive and it has a lot of herbs and and spices and to me it was also an excuse he was like oh well you know um technically i'm not really drinking this is for you know venison medicinal value right <laughs> so that's kind of like you know how how it all started for me well, what's in it that that has been proven to to make you feel better I know that there is a very high saffron content, mm. not that saffron has, you know, extreme, you know, medicinal value to it. But I just know that there's just a lot of, you know, roots, roots, root spices and vegetables, not vegetables, but, you know, spices and, and herbs that, um, you know, that that you do find in in in, in old medicine. And, and is Fernet its own type of alcohol or is it that a brand of like this licorice kind of tasting alcohol it's both <laughs> really so and, yeah and so to me it's just like I, I i also you know especially now when i have a restaurant a lot of friends are like oh you know my stomach hurts or no i can't because i feel like so stuff and you know full and and because it, it's a digestive and and people usually take it you know like just a very small sip after a meal just to kind of like you know clear their their cleanse their palate as well as you know their stomach um, it's something that's become a thing where it's like, oh, you have a, you know, you, you, you have an, um, an issue. I have a remedy, <laughs> right? <laughs> even, um, even when we don't have issues, you have that remedy ready to go. 
Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot. What What did you do before you got into the food scene? I was a real estate broker. Um, so at the time, it was, I think it was 15 years. I was a real, I mean, I, I'm, I'm still licensed, just not working, you know, at the capacity I was working before I moved to New York. Um, but I started real estate in 2000, 2007 when the market crashed. Mm, wow. <laughs> so there's a lot of parallels in terms of, you know, me starting the real estate career as well as me starting my, my food and, and beverage um, culinary career. You know, for, for, the listeners, for the listeners that don't know your restaurant in New York, um, it is to me like a Mecca because all of my friends that I value in terms of their taste all come to see you, you know, all the, that makes me really happy. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> producer friends or chef people, they all say, you know, they're going to go out to see Helen at Saigon Social. And so it's, it's a thing where I wonder what do you think, how do you feel? What do you, where does that, do you think that that comes from? There's got to be something because there's good, a good maybe 20, 30 Vietnamese restaurants in New York, but your name comes up continuously, <laughs> uh, consistently. <laughs> Um, that they're going to come out to see you. And um, it's it's just a thing. You know, when I was living in Seattle, you know, as a real estate broker, obviously, you, 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 your, your job is to prospect. It's, it's to network. It's to meet people. It's, you know, one of my mentors would always tell me there's two types of people in the world. There's the people that I know and then there's the people that you don't know. Which group is going to be the larger group? Especially when you're looking at it from a business, you know, standpoint, as, specifically, you know, in sales, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the answer is the people that you don't know. So I, you know, believe it or not, was very timid when I started my real estate career. It was very difficult for me to cold call, to really be out there and break out of my comfort zone to really try to um, just connect with people. And through, through a lot of training, a lot of, you know, guidance, a lot of mentorship and just um, practicing, uh, I, I improved and, and, and was able to um, break out of that, you know, that, that space of fear and discomfort to really go out there and just really meet, meet people. And I think that um, when you look at it, from a standpoint of, you know, I don't, I mean, even though like the core of it, it's like, yeah, this is my job. I found a lot of joy in just having genuine conversations and connecting with people because I felt that when you approach, you know, a business deal on a very like salesy and a very aggressive and pushy like tone and approach, it doesn't always work well. And it wasn't really something that resonated with like my heart and my style of, of truly connecting with people. So then I think that from there, it's just, you know, over time, you, you build relationships and that, that, you know, the, that business, you know, relationships that in turn, turn to friendships. And then from that, it becomes a community, not just within your industry, but also within, you know, I mean, like, for example, with, um, as a real estate broker, you work, you know, closely with title officers and loan officers and escrow agents and inspectors and um, contractors, builders, developers, the list goes on. And it, it takes, a community to make anything happen, regardless of what industry, what, what your job is, right? There's always going to be like that, that, that network of people that rely on each other to, to make things happen. And um, I always found great joy in it. Um, when I left Seattle, it was, you know, I had, I had gotten to the point where I built a very, you know, strong network of people and community through friends and family and obviously being raised there uh, and living there for 25 years. Um, it's an, you know, it's almost one of those things where it's inevitable, you know, you like the city is, is no matter where you go, it, no matter how big of a metropolis it is, it's still very small when you spend a majority of your life there. Um, so when I first moved to New York, I had one friend. Um, it was a very, um, it was a very rough transition for me. It was something that was supposed to be temporary. It was just, you know, oh, I guess a, a one year semi sabbatical, if you will, just to go to culinary school to check it off my bucket list. And then, you know, essentially move back home to Seattle after that was done. Um, and because I only knew one friend and, you know, she was, you know, she was, her schedule was very intense in that 
she would go to school and then from school come home change and then would go straight to work and I wouldn't see her until like 11 30 12 o'clock at night I spent a lot of my time um, just volunteering at school just because I didn't really know what else oh. to do and from that point it was just okay there's a there's a, an opportunity there's an event okay I, I would sign up to do it would volunteer to do it just because um I just didn't know what else to do with my time at the moment. And I think from that, it was just um, very natural to meet people because one, one event would, you know, would lead to another and one opportunity would open doors to another. And I think that when you don't really think about the end goal and you just let yourself truly uh, immerse in free fall, um, the, the rewards are incredibly um or the, the outcome is incredibly rewarding and very beautiful relationships are, are, are born and, 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 you know, nurtured from there. And this is my, I'm now in my sixth year of living in New York. So imagine just like six years of just continuously talking to people and, and making genuine connections, I think, you know, has been, and, you know, and I've been very, very fortunate in, in that, you know, the community has been very welcoming and supportive. Um, and I really just believe that it just starts with a conversation and just pushing yourself out of your comfort zone to talk to people that you don't know. And in my case, I didn't know a lot of people here. So every day was an opportunity to make, you know, a connection and a new friend and, and be a part of, you know, community. You know, at the, at the same time that I'm mind blown, I'm also, I kind of, I kind of see it, you know, spending time with you and the friends that we came to New York with, I could see that there's the roots of, of a shy person in you. Um, and I wondered that on the whole trip where this is a person who's so shy and it, it just, you just <laughs> feel like a shy person. I'm not saying that, you know, you just seem like a very shy person and you're, you're, you're relatively quiet for somebody in the restaurant space, you know, in my opinion, but hearing you develop from one friend to what I know now about the sort of the network of you know Vietnamese people across the country, um, and what you've built is uh, is really phenomenal. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. What do you call that? An extroverted introvert? Yeah. Um, are, are, do you consider? I feel like we take so many personality tests that it's just you know, and then depending on the, the time of day and the mood that you know that you're in, you don't really know which you you fall into. I think we're all get, a little bit of everything. Do you get tired after a, a long day of socializing, or do you get more energy? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I feel that you know when when I was in real estate, I enjoyed socializing very much so, just because um, it wasn't because my job depended on it. It was because I had a lot more control over my my hours, over my schedule. And and of course, you know, that took several years and and a lot of challenges and adversities just to to get to that point. But the fact is that I did get to the point where I was able to to have a lot more control over my schedule. And when you have control over your schedule, um it becomes a lot more relaxing in the sense where it's like, okay, you know, if I wanted to work today, I would work today. If I didn't want to work to, you know, today, then I had the flexibility not to do so because essentially, you know, you're, 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 you're your own brand, you're independent contractor. And it wasn't a, a job that you had to go in and clock in and clock out. It's essentially the work that you put in, the time you put in, you know, is a, you know, it's going to be a function of what, you know, your productivity and your success is going to be like, whatever, you know, that means for you. And now here in the restaurant, I no longer have that flexibility, at least not in the moment, because essentially it's a startup. And I think with, you know, every given startup, you know, comes a lot of sacrifice and responsibilities. And when you have a team that's reliant on you and a business that's open um, majority of the week, you can't just wake up and decide, oh, you know, today I don't want to open up the restaurant or I don't want to show up or don't want to do these things just because you now have a team that you have to support, um, you know, whose families, you know, depend on them. And every decision is no longer about what your, you know, wants and what your needs are. It's essentially going back to, well, you know, when, when I decided that this is what I was going to do, um, I understood that the foundational responsibilities was, was there, but I think that I completely underestimated one and, and was very, you know, ill-prepared for 
the realization and, and just the depth of, you know, everything else that comes along with it. Because before I was like, oh, I want to learn how to cook. I want to be a professional cook. And you think that that's going to be majority of your, your job and your responsibilities. But now that I look at it, it's, you know, people come in, I'm like, oh, thank you so much for a good, you know, like we had a great time. The meal was amazing. And I was like, don't thank me, thank my team. They're the ones on the line doing the job. I, 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 it feels like I do everything but cook these days because it's now turned into management and, and um, just making sure that, you know, every, every loophole, every, every responsibility is filled. Right. Um, but yeah, so it's like, you're forced to be on, right. You're forced to be on. And I don't take that for granted. I, 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 you know, it's definitely not a complaint. It's just understanding and having like a very honest conversation with yourself, you know, as to what needs to be done to get where you, you know, like need to be and, and just reflecting on the short-term, long-term personal, as well as, you know, professional goals that, you know, you're, you're setting for yourself. So with that being said, it's just like, yeah, you know, you have to remind yourself that you may be having the same conversation um, every five minutes, you know, every hour for like 10, 15 hours a day, but every connection is different. Every person is different. So it's, you know, it's, it, it can be taxing and exhausting, but you owe it to, you know, each customer, each interaction um, to, to really be present, I guess, if you will, because, you know, just because I get tired with one conversation doesn't mean that I have to transfer that energy to the next person yeah. that I interact with, right? It's just not fair. You, you know, having a restaurant in New York is, you know, it's akin to like going out into the ocean and swimming out in the middle of nowhere and not seeing land at all. Uh, oh, to years, say the least. <laughs> right? And, and six years in and, um, you know, you're saying it's, a, it's still a startup and there's probably no sign of land anywhere in terms of taking sort of a breather, a break, a real break where you can hand off responsibility to, to, to another person. What keeps you going? What drives you to continue every day to grind that hard? You know, it's truly the community. It's also the team. I mean, the team is ever changing, um, especially, you know, just looking at our journey as, you know, how we started like the first two years was a pop up. And then it was like, okay, let's, you know, I think I got the hang of this and have an understanding of how people eat here on, on the East coast. And, you know, in, specifically in New York, let's open a restaurant. Um, and, you know, to, to have it, you know, have all of these plans kind of play out and, and be executed in the midst of a pandemic just kind of throws um, a huge and never ending curveball at yeah. every corner that you turn essentially. And I think that, um, you know, be, because of that, there hasn't ever been like stability in terms of, you know, the team. So it, it's been very, um, I guess you can say like the turnover rate was very high the first year or two, just because, you know, we were on shutdown, right? And yeah. it was during the peak of the pandemic. But regardless if it was, you know, the team past, present or, you know, or future, I think that once you make that connection with people and you, you know, you share that synergy and that camaraderie and that alignment, it really keeps you going just because you are no longer just operating at, you know, your level, you're operating at, you're is like, you know, absorbing like the energy and, and just kind of, you know, the, the, the zone that everyone else is in. And on the days where I feel like, okay, you know, like I'm, I'm a little under the weather, wh whether it be, you know, emotionally or physically, um, one of our team members would come in with a lot of energy and then you just kind of like absorb that from them. And then, you know, we, we, we go into the whole dance of prepping for service, you know, and then, um, and then actually going into service and then meeting the people, serving them, cooking them and, and making sure that they have a good experience here and just thriving off of their experience and, watching them take that for a very first bite or very first sip of broth and having them enjoy it, I think is incredibly gratifying and you can't really put a monetary value to that. Right. It's just, um, it's just something where, yeah, you may be having a very long day, but it's just that one moment, even though it could be like five to 10 seconds where it's just like, oh, okay, 
this is what it's all about. This is why we're doing what we're doing. And I think that it's what they call where when you know that you're in the right field and doing what you love and, and as cliche as it sounds, when it's, it feels like it's a part of your, an extension of your being. I don't think that it feels like work. Yeah. And for that reason, it's just like, okay, I'm exhausted, but every morning I wake up and I'm excited, you know, to do it all over again, regardless of what my mental or physical state is just because I know that when I come in here, I see my prep team, you know, like, you know, or, or our serving team. And then just knowing that, you know, on Thursdays, you know, this regular comes in and then seeing our purveyors and our delivery people and having that, you know, continued, you know, conversations about their families and, and to be able to make that connection on a day to day really makes it, um, makes it ex exciting yeah. and gives you that energy and that push to kind of just keep going. I mean, I, I don't know how to explain it, but it's just one of those things where it's like, it just feels right. You know, it feels right. It feels like home. And, and um, until I wake up one morning and feel like, okay, I'm exhausted. I, I can't do this anymore. I think this is, you know, the path that I'm going to continue on. But has it happened before? Has, has that feeling kind of pervaded you and you've turned it around? Yeah, I, I think that it, it, it comes in waves, but I, I think that um, it's important to keep your mindset strong, uh, to preserve your energy and, and, and be very aware um, and cautious with how you spend your time. Because I think, you know, as we, as we get older and as our schedules become a lot more complex and demanding, um, that's the only thing of value that we can truly control, you know? I mean, your finances can come and go and there's been a lot of factors and functions from that. But when it comes to your energy, it's the one thing that you do have control over, right? The yeah. one thing where it's like, okay, yeah, you know, I'm not feeling so great, but what's causing it? Is it the people that I'm hanging out with? Is it the conversations that I'm having? Is it, you know, the environment that I am I'm in? And then just making sure that you position yourself and, keep that peace of mind and that energy going. And I think that essentially sets the tone for, you know, everything else and the, and the decisions that you make, just because when you're flustered and when you're angry and, and you're feeling all this, you know, like negativity, it really hinders everything else that you do. Right. When you left culinary school, what was lined up for you in, in terms of your vision for what you wanted to accomplish? In terms of alignment, I really didn't have anything lined up in that moment. It was just, okay, the goal I made for myself was to go home. Do I want to go home? I mean, the first month um, of living in New York and of, you know, of, of culinary, the culinary program, I flew home every week. Um, and it was fun being bi-coastal just because it's like, oh, you know, I, you, know you fly back and forth, but it, it became very exhausting became very exhausting. And, and I did it, you know, not because I wanted to be cool and, and live this bi-coastal life, but it was just, you know, um, I still had my real estate, you know, career. And that essentially was what was, you know, making money and, and allowing me the freedom to, to pursue, you know, this, this, this passion of mine. Um, it's something that I've always wanted to do. Um, but, you know, growing up with a single mother and a sister who is, you know, 10 years younger, she was essentially like my daughter. And I wanted to make sure that she completed her studies and had job security before I kind of went off and did what I did. And so then when I made the decision to move, um, I, you know, everything was kind of prepaid for for a year just because I know that that was kind of the benchmark that I made for myself. Right. But also understanding that, you know, when I started my, my, my culinary program and um, had an amazing opportunity to, to work at, um, at a restaurant, I was just, you know, looking at the finances and I was just like, how do people survive in New York? I think that I was making 1175 an hour, Wow. you know, and you're on your feet all day. It's, you know, mentally taxing majority of the people that I went to school with and also worked with were like 10, 15 years younger. And during that time, I couldn't bring myself to telling people what my background was and how old I was because I didn't want to get judged for it. I really wanted to learn. I really wanted to earn 
whatever you know level of advancement or or just knowledge that that I could truly absorb and take away with me um, on my own terms, right? Not just because oh you know, she's a little bit older, maybe we should be a little bit more gentle, or because this is a career change, it's completely new and foreign. So um, I didn't want that to be an excuse, right. Um, But yeah, so you know, as I was, you know, like, it was my schedule was basically, I would wake up early in the morning between five and six, school was between seven and noon. And then right when school let off, I would take the you know, the train downtown, all the way uptown, start my shift at 12.30 p.m. and then end it at 1, 1 a.m., sometimes 2 a.m., depending on the day. And I didn't know that was considered part-time. To me, part-time was like, okay, maybe 20 hours, right? But essentially that was like, you know, my, my schedule. And then on Friday nights, I would take the last flight out from New York to Seattle land in Seattle, like between, you know, 1130 midnight or whatever it was. And then Saturday, Sunday was my real estate days. Crank out as much as I can, meet as many people, get as much done. Sunday night, take the red eye flight out from New York, land, um, you know, or from Seattle to New York, land in New York at between five to 630 on Monday mornings, and then go straight to school from the airport. And that was pretty much the very first year of, of me living in New York. Um, And I think as I delve deeper into my culinary studies and my my culinary journey, if you will, I was like, I really love this. I came home and I cried every single night that first week of of work just because it wasn't what I imagined it to be. I was like, cooking's supposed to be fun. I didn't realize that, you know, it was going to be so physically taxing Mm -hmm. and, you know, so demanding on your schedule and your body, right? Um, but towards the end of my culinary program, there was this resurgent in, I guess, Vietnamese dining, you know, there was new restaurants were being opened. They were, you know, all, you know, became very wildly successful and people were so receptive of it. And something just clicked inside of me. I'm like, you know, I, I, I don't know what's going on, but I want to be a part of it. Um, regardless if you know how small my contribution is, I, I just really felt very excited, very inspired. And though I was tired, I felt that, okay, maybe this, you know, I loved real estate. I still love real estate. It's, you know, definitely like a passion of mine. And I think will forever be, you know, a part of me. But I love cooking and hospitality more. And I, and, I, and I just knew that, you know, there are days where it's like, okay, well, you know, I can get tired and wake up and still feel excited about real estate, but the excitement I felt about cooking and just, you know, being in that whole song and dance of, you know, um, the restaurant industry just ignited something much bigger inside of me than real estate did. So then I decided, I was like, well, you know, if I was 15 years younger, I would attach myself, you know, to a restaurant group and work my way from the bottom up and just really do a deep dive into learning. But because it was, you know, essentially a career change so much later on in life, I didn't have that luxury of time to be like, okay, I'm going to start, you know, from here. And when you think about finances, there's no way that I can continue supporting my family, you know, my mom back home, and then also myself living on 1175, right? Yeah. An hour. So then it was either I go back home and continue my life, you know, as a real estate broker, um, or I stay here and start a business because at least I know that whatever I put into that business, um, I can and have control and visibility over, at least that's what I initially thought pre-pandemic, right? And so then I was like, you know, I'm going to stay and open a restaurant. Uh, I mean, there are so many amazing concepts that were, you know, that were taking off and I I thoroughly enjoyed my experiences with them and were very inspired by all the operators and all the chefs and the talent that I came across. But though their food was really good in its own way, it just still didn't feel like home. You know, and I'm sure, you know, you've traveled a lot, you know, between West Coast and East Coast and everywhere else in between. Um, But then um, the flavors are just not the same. You know, West Coast Vietnamese food is very different from East Coast Vietnamese food. 
And though we've come leaps and bounds and continue to do so, there's just like this, this element that's missing. Wait. And I'm not saying I'm the person that's going to bring it. I'm just saying that, you know, I grew up eating a little bit differently and, and you, you know, people may not agree with the things that I'm doing and I'm cooking, but at least I'm giving myself and the world an opportunity to experience, you know, me as a cook and the flavors that I grew up eating in the eighties, the nineties, or, you know, and even, you know, current time. Right. So, um, what, yeah, what, that's what how is the, it came about. What is the difference between East Coast and West Coast Vietnamese food? What are some of the major differences? I think it's a lot sweeter. Well, you know what? Actually, the very first thought that comes to mind, and it's still like an ongoing gripe, I don't understand the spring roll and the summer roll thing here on the East Coast. You know, when you think about goi kuang, I'm like, okay, that's a spring roll, right? And you come here and like, no, that's a summer roll. But and there's some restaurants you go to, and they're like, well, that's an autumn roll. Like, so do you guys just name your food based on seasons? <laughs> <laughs> but but that goes on out here, too. That There are people out here that call it a summer roll as well. But I'm I've, sorry? There's people out in the West Coast that call a goikung a summer roll, too. Yeah, like, and then, I don't and then it's just like, okay, well, then it's like, oh, this is a fried spring roll. I'm like, it's a jaya. A jaya is a jaya, not like, you know, you. Right. It's, the terminology gets very convoluted um you know obviously it has nothing to do with you know the, the taste and flavor profile but i just always thought that it, it was, was always a point of contention in conversations i would have with with east coast natives where like no that's definitely a summer roll that's not a spring roll i wonder where that comes from the etymology yeah. of all this that's an interesting point point. and where where the hell did summer roll come where did spring roll come from you know, yeah. We should, we should start there. Like, where did, wh like, why? How do you go from goi kung, which is a, essentially a salad roll, right? Goi is like salad, uh, and kung is roll. And how do you get spring roll out of that? Right. <laughs> and then how do you go from spring to summer roll? Like, who? And then, and to... then from spring, you know, you get it. You get into autumn, right? So yeah, I've never heard has... of autumn roll. That's the first for me. <laughs> But I mean, yeah, so that's, that's, that's the first thing that always comes to mind when I think about that. And then when it comes to flavor, I feel that it's a lot sweeter here. Um, it's a lot sweeter here. I, and, and I, and I, from, from my understanding, and, and I could be like, you know, terribly wrong, but here in New York, there used to be a very, a much larger Vietnamese community than, you know, than, um, than there was currently now. But I think the cost of living was just like, so, so high then people would move to Virginia, to Philadelphia, to the, you know, the Carolinas, um, to DC. And I think that the majority um, of the Vietnamese community that was here, they're Thieu Jiao, right? Mm. Thieu, Thieu Jiao Vietnamese. And mm. with Thieu Jiao, the, the style and the, the flavor profile kind of lends on like the sweeter note. When you think about them when they make their soups, um, and then when you have a Tiu Chao person making pho, I feel like there's a stronger note of cinnamon, and there's you know the cardamom, you know, uh, cardamom is, is 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 more prevalent, and essentially changes the, um, I guess, just I guess the flavor of the soups, right? The base yeah. is more is is it's sweeter, the, accentuates yeah. the sweeter uh, cinnamon, it, it, car yeah, cardamom. Makes it a little bit right. feel sweeter. And then, I mean, the I think that the, the foundation of Vietnamese cooking is our herbs and our vegetables, right. which there is a um, a huge lack of here in New York. Yeah. yeah. You know, obviously due to climate. You know, you go to California, uh, even, you know, from where I'm at in Seattle, you go to the supermarket, you get a larger variety of greens and herbs. And I think that that really um, brings out, you know, certain flavors and really captures the essence of our cooking, especially supporting like the sauces and everything. Whereas here in New York, you do have access to all these things, but they're not as fresh. Right. Um, their shelf life isn't as long, right? So then there's a huge compromise in flavor. And sometimes certain dishes go without. And that's just the way that it has to go. For, like, you know, rather than having to serve um, herbs that aren't, aren't so great in quality. 
Yeah, that's a that's a thing that we really enjoy in the West Coast is the the quality of herbs that we have out here. It's uh, I you know my opinion it's you know the the food on the West Coast is almost better and these are fighting words for some people better than even in Vietnam. The quality of of the produce that we have, the quality of the meats that we have, access to all of the the ingredients is to me it's superior to anywhere else in the world. I, I would have to agree. I think that when you look at it from all different points, you know, from irrigation systems to access, you yeah. know, to to all of that, it's it's definitely um, the the quality control is a lot more consistent, right? Um, and I think that um, you know, yeah, like I'm a West Coast girl through and through, and my I think my heart will always be sided with you know the West Coast Vietnamese you know culinary um, offering. Yeah. Even though, you know, now that I'm, I'm, you know, pretty much very rooted here in New York, but they're like, I mean, for one, I, I, I barely cook the food that I eat. Um, I mean, obviously I, I'm a part of like the whole tasting and, you know, I'll, 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 I'll taste and I'll, I'll eat it throughout, you know, the day just to make sure that, you know, these are the, like, you know, the, 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 the profiles that I, I want to, to share and showcase, but when it comes to truly eating, it's, um, there hasn't really been a place where it's like, okay, you know, this really tastes like home and this is where I would like, you know, to frequent every single day or at least, you know, majority of the week, um, just because nothing truly compares to West Coast cooking. <laughs> you know, what uh, what inspired you to name the restaurant Saigon Social? You know, when I was thinking of a name for my pop-up, and then, you know, I was like, okay, well, you know, if I'm going to do a pop-up and obviously a restaurant, you know, might, might be like, you know, in, in the works. Um, I was like, I really wanted to incorporate Saigon in it. Cause I think about when you're in New York, it's very similar to Saigon where right. it's a melting pot of, um, of cultures, of, of dining experiences where it's essentially a city and the annex of all of these derivatives, right? So then to me, it's like, okay, I, I want to add Saigon into it, but what, you know, Saigon what, you know? And um, I remember I was on a trip. I think I actually was in Taipei. Was it Taipei or Hong Kong with a group of friends? And I was just reading different articles on my phone in, in, in an Uber ride. Um, from, from, you know, one restaurant to another. And I think I was looking at property and um, just essentially talking to myself. And I don't know where the, the word social came up. And then I was like, social, Saigon like social. I actually really like the way that it sounds. And, you know, for me, I, you know, I was like, I, I'm a very social person, you know, back home. And, and, you know, essentially that's what I've been doing here as I'm, learning how people eat in New York as I'm learning how business are run and as I'm learning how to just um, transition into living and adapting to like the lifestyle and I guess the culture, if you will, here in New York. Um, it's forced me to be even more social than ever. And when you think about social gatherings, you know, it's usually around a meal. And then I just kept on repeating it over and over. And I was like, I think Saigon Social is going to be the name for my pop-up. Um, and then after two, like plus years of kind of running it, I was like, I, I don't want to change it. I mm -hmm. kind of want to carry it over to the restaurant because it just sound, sound very fitting and it just, it just felt right. Yeah. I, I love that word, uh, social in conjunction with the, how you're using it with Saigon. It reminds me of, uh, the Buena Vista social club, which, you know, Buena Vista social club is a, is a group a music group. Uh, and, you know, social and music are sort of like food and social, right? It's like part of what we do when we connect with other human beings is, you know, we're in the space, whether we're listening to music live, like the Buena Vista Social Club or we're at Saigon Social, it, 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 it involves people, it involves a society. And it's such a beautiful pairing. Yeah, and, and I always tell my team this, I was like, you know, yes, we are, in every sense of the word, a restaurant. But to me, I don't see it as just a restaurant. It goes far beyond that. I think that um, going back to what your original question was of like, did I, did I know what my vision was? I didn't know what my vision was um, 
you know, when I was in culinary school, I didn't know what it was. Even when I was, you know, building the restaurant and, you know, getting ready for the, you know, the opening and what I thought I knew, I think completely unraveled during the pandemic. And um, I remember just talking to people and they're like, well, you know, if you were to explain to someone that doesn't know you, that doesn't know Vietnamese food, that doesn't know anything at all, what would you say the concept of your restaurant is? What is what does it really mean to you? And what is it that you're trying to share, you know, with the world? And I think that it's something that I struggled with immensely just because what I thought I knew, I learned that I didn't really know at all. Um, and I think starting with food, when I hosted these weekly pop-ups, my menu was ever changing. There was nothing that was a repeat and, and essentially it was just, you know, kind of like the perfect scenario for my ADD, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I go today, I'm going to make this and then that just because I want it, you know, to test recipes, just to test flavors and see how people, um, would receive it. Right. So that it would, um, Enable, enable me to make decisions um, for the future. And I think that um, I was so headstrong on just trying to capture the true essence and the traditional form of cooking and only offering traditional foods um, and holding back on things that I truly love and enjoy just because I thought that in order to be very traditional and authentic, I needed to cook things the way that they're presented and as close to flavors in Vietnam as possible, because I wanted to really appease and to make, you know, my culture and my people proud um, of the things that I'm able to, to showcase and accomplish and share um, in the culinary world. And um, I think that that really hindered um, my ability to really create just because I was limiting myself into this box that I thought was the right thing to do. Right. And throughout the pandemic, you know, we all go through these revelations, right? And I just remember that during my pop-up, whenever I would see a Vietnamese client specifically and, you know, like an elder, you know, auntie or grandma that would come and eat, I would feel so excited just because, wow, it's like, these are the people that I want to cook for that I want to, to showcase my food for. And, you know, essentially their family members, but I was met with a lot of criticism oh, wow. and I would lose so much sleep over it. I mean, the very first criticism would be obviously the pricing, um, but beyond that, it's like, okay, well, if you take price out of the factor, like, let's talk about the things that really matter in terms of flavor, right? Because pricing, you can adjust. Flavors, styles, and, you know, what you're trying to share and present mm -hmm. is something that, yes, essentially can be adjusted, but is it true to what you want it, like, yeah. what you really want to do? And I, like, like I said, I lost, you know, I lost sleep over it. I would think, you know, and be, be so sad when people would, you know, provide feedback and be like, this is not how, you know, it's supposed to be. And this is not how you're supposed to do it. And when you have, you know, this community that you're, you're struggling to connect with to, to make proud and you're, you're, you're seeing that you're met with like so much, you know, criticism, it makes you really realize, you know, like, or, or really like think, is this truly what you want? And so I would ask myself that question. I was like, what's going on here? And I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out. And then I just realized that, you know, I've been, been trying so hard to extract just, you know, this, this person that I'm not. Because the reality of it is I was not born in Vietnam. You know, my experiences were from these annual trips that I would take with family, with social gatherings and different, you know, organizations that I've grown to be a part of here in the States, you know. So I'm not Vietnamese, I'm Vietnamese American. Wow. And I think that realizing that, accepting that and really understanding what that means because it's like I'm a, you know, I'm I'm a product of both cultures, not just one. And that it's okay to make adaptations and changes um, from what I knew growing up as a child, living in California, then Houston, and you know, then Seattle, and and um 
carrying those experiences and those flavors um, from my from my upbringing into the way that I cook um, is something that I really needed to dial in and focus on, not trying to be like yeah. that stall on that street corner, you know, in Hanoi or in Guignang, because that's a completely different, you know, outreach, right? I mean, for one, that's not who I grew up being. You know, it's not, you know, I, I, I didn't have access to those exact ingredients, right? So, of course, my style of cooking and my flavors are going to be different because, um, you know, it's just you're in completely different climates and completely different countries, right, for one. And then also for two, it's just that um, I didn't quite understand that value, you know, or my value as, as a person as to what um what and who I really wanted to be and I think that um that truly showed um and and I realized that I think mid-pandemic where I was just like you know why am I trying so hard to be someone that I'm not I should you know focus my time and energy and really dial into what truly makes me happy and you know if I want to throw butter in my steak I'm good. I should throw butter in my steak and cook it the way that I that I know how to eat, that I really enjoy to eat, that I really love to eat, that I know, you know, people would truly love and enjoy because that's kind of like my style. And, and that's just, you know, the flavor profiles that I'm comfortable with. So then it came back to just looking at my menus, you know, um, and the things that I, I've created in the past and just sitting down and re-engineering it. I'm like, okay, well, I've done this because this is what I knew and I was taught, but am I okay with that? Or is there a different element that I want to change to make it something that I would truly enjoy and be proud of because this is now a byproduct of Helen, right? Not what yeah. the community yeah. wants and not what people think, you know, that they want. So then mm -hmm. with that came a lot of empowerment, you know, and it's like, then when it came back to just, doing R&D and cooking in the kitchen, it completely changed my energy, my Liberated perspective. Liberated you, right? Um, and then I was like, wow, I'm feeling, I'm, I'm, come, I'm cooking from a very good place. Yeah. I'm truly cooking from the heart and not holding back because I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a, a burger and I'm going to stay true to my Vietnamese, wow. you know, roots and be able to make that connection um, in terms of flavor but then I grew up eating a lot of burgers, so I'm going to put a burger on the menu. And yes, it's not traditional, but it's, you know, and some people are like, well, it's not really authentic. But then it's like authentic to who? Mm -hmm. Were you in the same household as me growing up in the 80s? You weren't. So you can't say that that's not authentic yeah. because it was very authentic to who I was, right? And who I am. So then, um, then, it, you know, then it was just like, okay, well, now that I have that identity, and I have, you know, I'm, I'm moving forward with a lot more confidence and understanding what it is that I want to share. It completely changed everything for me. And then it was just like, okay, if you were to ask me what Saigon Social is, I can confidently tell you that it's, you know, a modern Vietnamese restaurant. And when I say modern, I'm not saying that, you know, we're using, you know, all these um, intricate, you know, cooking techniques. Some things are like, you know, yes, you know, the professional, you know, you know, techniques that I've learned, but at its core, we're very approachable. It's, it's very comforting. And when I say modern, it's kind of making that distinction that it's obviously not going to be your grandma's cooking. It's right. not your mom's cooking because I'm neither of those people, <laughs> you know, modern as in the flavors are still there at its core, but it's transformed into something different, um, which is an extension of who I am as a person. Right. And um, when, you know, we still have a lot of conversations with, with um, clients that are just like, no, this is not it. And I, you know, I find it very empowering to say, yeah, you're absolutely right with what, you know, what your thoughts and your opinions are. But I'm telling you that this is what my intention for it is. And you don't have to agree. And if it's something, you know, it's something else that you want like to look for, just let me know what it is. And I'll be more than happy to recommend 10 other, offer, you know, like restaurants that will offer the experience and the flavor profiles and maybe even the pricing that you, you want, you know, to achieve. But if you come in here and if you ask me a question, then I'll tell you what the intention and, and the soul and the core of every dish and every experience is supposed to be. And you have every right to agree or disagree with it. But understand that as a team, everyone here 
knows what we're trying to achieve from the experience to, you know, to, to the flavors and every day, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but we come in giving it our best every day to procure that experience. And you have to be okay with people not agreeing with you. And just knowing that whatever percentage of people that do agree with you and that do enjoy, that's where you have to put your focus and your attention on because essentially that's, you know, what matters, right? Listening to you speak in the last few minutes reminds me of sort of like the artist journey where you start out and you do your paintings and you're kind of just going with things and then you suddenly you find your voice and you get empowered by the vision and the and the feel and the 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 ideas that you want to express and then at some point the critique or anything like that just goes out the window and you just embrace your own specific way of doing things and to get to that takes years to arrive in that journey right yeah i mean i think you know it's 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 different for everybody sometimes you know people are very lucky and they get it within seconds within minutes if their their brain is wired that way yeah. right if they're able to make that connection and that's really great but for others it may take months years decades and it doesn't really matter at what age or what stage in your life the, you know all i think it's all that i think that truly matters is that you have that awareness and that you continue to do the things that 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 make you feel alive do the things that make your heart sing do the things that that you're passionate about and as cliche as it sounds it's truly in the in the journey not really like the destination yeah. or the outcome because i think within that process you you may not you may think that this is one thing that you want but you learn through you know the the ups and downs and you know the adversities that you know that sometimes you're rewarded with experiences that you didn't think you needed right um, with um, relationships that you didn't think that, mm -hmm. you know, you, that would come of it. So I think it truly is, it's like, so long as you're aware of it, don't worry about when it's going to happen. Right. Just truly be present and make sure that you're being true to what your intentions and what you know, your, your goals are that you're setting for yourself. And, you know, that could be a day, it could be a year, it could be 10 years, like whatever it is. I think oftentimes we get so caught up on the end goal that we forget that it's truly the experiences and everything in between that matters a lot more that carries so much weight and value um, than just getting there itself, right? You know, I have, <laughs> this is always a dilemma for me. I have, you know, 20, 30 questions always prepared from, <laughs> you know, your experience with, uh, you know, Daniel. And, you know, we ha we didn't even get a chance to get into that complex sort of training that you went through, uh, this idea of, you know, the tenacity of going through the pandemic, because I know you, you've told me stories about how di difficult it was. You know, there's so many uh, things, but today, I think the most important thing for me is getting a sense of who you are as Helen from Saigon Social, because it gives me and the audience a glimpse of the artists and the artistry behind the food that comes out of your kitchen and sort of like the, even the way you've socially constructed the way the experience is for the, for the customers that come in to eat. And so getting a, 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 a real intimate view of who you are trumps all of the other questions about training and how you got to, you know, to, to your journey, just to get to hear the artists, explain who they are is is so valuable to me thank you thank you um i i really appreciate all of that i always joke but you know there's some truth that you have to be crazy to be in this industry <laughs> for sure you know I, I think that you know I, i'm i'm learning so much about myself i think that you know yes from the outside looking in it's a lot of food and it's a lot of cooking and it's a lot of socializing but it's become a lot more personal project and journey for me. And in, in that it's like, yes, I love doing all these things, but the most rewarding experience for me has been truly um, learning and having that, that, that really intimate, um, intimate dialogue with myself as to, you know, who I'm being like, what my past and like, how did I get here? And what do I see for myself in the future versus just 
you know, the things that are, that are, I guess, materialistic or, or that's tangible, like all those things. Yes. You know, like sometimes, you know, like they're, they're very valuable, but I think that what's more important is just the internal, right. Uh, at least for me, yeah. um, when it comes to like, you know, like talking about, um, careers and, and, you know, your space and your voice and food or whatever industry that you're in. You know, I want to end with, uh, talking about every Wednesday you have a, your kitchen is doing um, meals for for older people in your community, right? Can you tell me a little bit about that and what has really allowed you to keep going um, with that service? Yeah, so, I mean, as you know, we were supposed to open March 13th, 2020. Um, that didn't happen. And the restaurant at its core became a commissary slash community kitchen. Um, I met some amazing friends um, at the very beginning of, of the pandemic. And we were working with a few different nonprofits that were creating meals for frontline healthcare workers. Um, you know, started off with like maybe 50 meals a day, 30 meals a day, onward to like 500 meals a day. And we, um, I, I met Moon and Yin, who are the, the founders of Heart of Dinner, a nonprofit that, um, that has been working tirelessly to provide um, meals to homebound elders, um, both you know singular residents as well as community like uh, senior communities. And I remember they had uh, had this conversation with me, like you know, there's a lot going on right now, and we want to be able to contribute and to be a part of this, but we don't know where to start. And it seems that frontline healthcare workers are getting an abundance of support what can we do in our background, in our community, and who really needs the help or who could really use like that boost? And they're like, well, we really want to help. Um, they're, they're, they were noticed that, you know, like, well, even before the pandemic, there was like this, this, this rise on, you know, an, you know, like anti-Asian, like all these hate crimes. And it was really sad to, to walk around Chinatown and see the, the, the business just plummet. And majority of the people that do live in Chinatown are the elders. And as business continue to shutter, they didn't really have a place to shop, a place to eat. So then Moon and Yin asked if I would be willing to just make 50, 60 meals, you know, and they were going to distribute it to um, a small community. And from that moment on, we were just like, yeah, okay, let's do this together. It became a much larger operation, um, you know, involving a lot more restaurant partners. And now fast forward, we're on year three. Wow. It still continues to be something that's part of our operation, even though we're, you know, a full blown restaurant now. But I think that, you know, it's important to make money, but it's also important to, to take care of your elders, to, to give back and to really, stay grounded, not just for myself, because I mean, before it used to be just me making these meals every Wednesday um, and, 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 and just essentially sleeping here, right? But now it's become an operation where my team gets to be a part of the cooking, the prepping, um, the delivering of the meals. And so it's just like, yeah, okay, yes, we're a restaurant, but also understand that we're a part of a greater purpose, a, a part of a greater community. And regardless of like how busy or, or what happens, you know, inside or outside of work. It's important to have that responsibility, you know, not just to your community, but to your elders. And, you know, like, like you know, you, you were able to experience and, and, and cook meals and contribute. And when you look at the, the videos and the photos, or, you know, just when we listen, listen to voice message that the elders leave, it's incredibly touching. And it really grounds you and really makes you think like, what the whole purpose of it is. Yeah. And, and if, if you can't take care of the people that have taken care of you, then it's like, what are you doing? Right. <laughs> What's the purpose of it? And um, yeah, it's, it's still something that we continue to do every Wednesday and we hope that we can continue, you know, to do it for as long as, you know, the, the organization and the, the needs are there. And um, it's just really beautiful. And I mean, once a month, we're, we're, we host them in here um, inside the restaurant so that they can have a very fun and dig dignified dining experience um, and be able to order from a menu and just that interaction and seeing them being able to like, you know, gather 
uh, you know, in a, in a social setting that's outside of their, you know, senior community, you can't, you can't put a dollar sign to that at all. You cannot. Yeah. And, you know, for most of them, it's towards the end of their life. Right. And I think, you know, they're very routine in their, in, in their lifestyles and the things that they do. And I, and that to be able to bridge that gap between like the younger generation. And even though we don't speak the same language, food is so universal that it truly connects everyone that's involved. And I think that it's very important to kind of, to carry that on, right? In, in whatever that we do. Um, and it gives, you know, I think a lot of um, insight to our team members who are like, oh, before, well, you kind of disappear and you, we don't really know what you're doing, but now that they're part of the operation and they get to interact and see the seniors that come in, I think that, okay, maybe your car broke down on the way to work or something happened, but you're experiencing this and are your problems really as big as you kind of magnify them to be, or, you know, think of them to be, or is, you know, when you think about people that truly are food insecure, that are going through true challenges and troubles in their life versus, you know, the mundane things that we complain about on a day to day that don't really, that aren't really problems at all. Right. So I, I think that, you know, it's, it's a very important life lesson. Um, and, and, also just, you know, a, a, like a feel good experience all around. Yeah. And it was definitely a feel good experience for me and bow and win. Thank you so much, Helen, for spending, mm -hmm. I know what is a very busy morning for you, a busy day. It seems like every day. And, uh, thank you. I appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you for having me, Kenneth. <laughs> of course, of course, okay. but we'll, we'll talk chat soon. soon. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you for listening to the Vietnamese with Kenneth Wynn. The Vietnamese is produced by Brittany Tran. Special thanks to Jane Wynn, Catherine Wynn, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Christo Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast. You can also find us on YouTube where you can subscribe, like, and comment. Please rate and give us a review wherever you find our podcasts.